Chicago. The title of the paper is Negotiated Black, Masculine, and Contemporary Theatrical Dance. And I use the word first broadly to infer a conscious or unconscious positioning of self and identity uh, in life and in art. And now in applying it specifically to the black masculine, I also infer uh, social political dimensions, which may be black male strategizing, choice making, mediating, navigating, and interacting within and against social structures. Uh, my use of the, of the term black, the black masculine uh, draws on critical uh, cultural theory perspectives by thinkers such as uh, Mark Anthony Neal and Maurice O. Wallace, so, who theorized the black masculine as a pluralistic and inclusive concept which encompasses gay and straight identity and which rejects unitary and normative constructions of masculine behavior. Hence, my aim here, here is to show, show that negotiating this pluralistic black masculine opens up ways for us to understand the contemporary black male dancing body as a critical site of race, gender, and sexuality in the 21st century. Um, I use uh, that lens to examine three works, uh, Brick, Inventing Pookie Jenkins, and Pavement by New York-based choreographer Kyle Abraham, uh, with emphasis on his representations of, of b-boy, queer, and uh, black male identity. Uh, as I proceed, however, I want to stipulate that I am not limiting negotiation just to queer representation, rather that my focus on Abraham, uh, in my focus on uh, Abraham, queer representation emerges as an integral part of his work. So Kyle Abraham, uh, Artistic Director of Abraham in Motion, uh, or AIM. Yes, Kyle Abraham is a recent recipient of several prestigious awards, including the Jacobs Pillow Award in 2012 and the MacArthur Award in 2013. He operates within the downtown postmodern dance in New York City and fuses pop culture, social commentary with formal postmodern dance ideals. His company is ethnically, di ethnically diverse, although predominantly consisting of men and women of color. Now, a close examination of his work uh, also reveals an emphasis on the male dancer. This, Abraham says, is because how he feels about his work is, very, is, is still a very key feature in the meaning of it. Now, Abraham does not explicitly subscribe to an African-centered ideology or a specific dance, uh, black dance aesthetic. Still, his work undeniably situates itself within uh, a black African diaspora performance because and through his explicit use of black male identity and the black experience, as I shall demonstrate. When I asked Abraham about my theory of negotiating the black masculine, he talked about his time in high school in Pittsburgh, where while discovering art and music and books, he also remembers have, feeling compelled to speak in a deeper voice when around his hip hop buddies, and, in fear, and that in fear of being marked as gay and vulnerable, or being accused of trying to be white, a type of negotiation. So um, I'd like to, sh I'd like to uh, talk about um, one of his first pieces, which is called Brick, yeah? Um, and this piece, I chose it because it, it, um, it contains a lot of imagery that uh, hopefully will uh, give you a better idea of what I'm talking about. So the piece takes inspiration from the, uh, the piece is called Brick, and it debuted in 2008. Uh, the piece takes inspiration uh, from the visual artist Kara Walker, whose minimalist uh, shadow sketches depict the African-American experience. As a whole, Brick has a contemplative quality, uh, and it begins with Abraham dressed in a hoodie and sweats and a huge Afro wig. He moves through a sequence of three positions around the backdrop uh, from standing progressively down to laying on the floor. 
while another male draws a figure around him, which kind of evokes uh, reminiscent of, of graffiti, but also for me, a kind of that, that anonymous dead body that was you know, taken away. Uh, I find that a very powerful image. And it is, I asked um, uh, uh, Abraham about that, and he said, well, it's not that, I also asked him about the, the image of death in, 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 in his uh, work, because it, this sort of image comes up quite often. Um, and he said it's not that he's being literal about death, but that there's that potential for tragedy, especially in the, re in the, in the black community and, and, and relations. Yeah, so that's how he uses it, and it's, also, it's very powerful. So after he gets back, uh, he's been laying down, after he gets back up, the other male figure uh, undresses Abraham, leaving him bare-chested in a gold lame, uh, uh, and a gold lame shirt-like pants and his body covered with dark paint. The male figure, figure kisses him tenderly and walks off with the rest of his clothes. This moment is significant because it's, it reveals what was underneath and simultaneously reveals a, a sensitive yet defiant uh, black male body. Yeah? So for 15 minutes, Abraham builds to a powerfully emotional climax set to raunchy rap score by uh, Lil' Kim and other rappers that talk about niggas and bitches dissing each other. Halfway through the dance, he climbs a rope and hangs there with, uh, with the rope under his arm yeah, for a while. Is he telling us, I'm asking myself, is he telling us what we are not, that we are not quite past the lynching of the black male body? Indeed, for me, that anonymous dead body, that hanging body in the middle of the piece, uh, reimagines the legacy of what Thomas de France as described in Simmering Passivity as the black male body marked from the start on the auction block, a powerfully exotic commodity, simultaneously becoming the object of fear and suspicion. That, for me, is key to understanding the inscription of the black male body and how it's carried forth. But also, I think of that as a negotiation because didn't uh, Brenda Dixon Godshaw, for, to borrow from Brenda Dixon Godshaw, she says, she, she makes it clear that the black body itself, male and female, has negotiated itself from coon to cool. Yeah? So I, I like that image. Um, so now because Brick takes such a long time to get moving, I'm going to show you an ex excerpt from um, from inventing uh, Pookie Jenkins, because he does a solo uh, which is very similar to the solo that eventually he does in Brick, but you'll see it right away, okay? Uh, and I'm showing it because it's very important, I think, for you to see the mixture of queer, hyper-masculine, uh, modern dance, all in one body, and see how you, uh, and appreciate how he fuses that. <laughs> Inventing Pookie Jenkins.
So I show this because Abraham's crotch grabbing, his overtly fey gestures, all at once affirm, uh, affirm uh, and subvert the limits of black masculine construction, upending normative connections between strength, queer, and manliness. And thus, I suggest, lays a space for reflecting uh, on and seeing things in a new way. Uh, I'll turn now to um, his uh, group piece, his, one of his newest pieces called Pavement. Yeah. Uh, talking about his inspiration for Pavement, Abraham recalls that at the age of 14 in 1991, he saw John Singleton's Boys in the Hood. Abraham states that he was blown away by what he saw as a struggle between inner and outer tensions of black male subjectivity, navigating, his word, their sense of self, and in particular, their vulnerabilities. In a broader sense, according to Abraham, the piece is also inspired by a passage from W.E.B. Du Bois, uh, Souls of Black Folk. Quote, men call the shadow prejudice and learnedly explain it as a natural defense of culture against barbarism, learning against ignorance, purity against crime, the higher against the lower races, W. Du Bois. Uh, for me, again, this is a kind of a, a broader um, racial uh, negotiation. So for me, this idea of negotiation, albeit fuzzy and hard to define, is there, is pounding away at you uh, across the ages. Um, uh, the choreographer expl explores these movements, these ideas, and, and uh, between literal and abstract uh, associations, which suggest but do not resolve relational situation. There is one female dancer who, for Abraham, kind of uh, uh, brings together all the women that are in the Boys of Hood film, uh, the mother, the lover, the sister, and that sort of thing. And she and this person kind of uh, provides a present, a kind of a conscious presence uh, among the dancers where you see men playful with each other, tender with each other, but also deadly in deadly rivalry with each other. So you see all these things in, in the, uh, the piece. I'm going to show you a, um, what I think is a very well put together um, a promotional video. And it will show you some of the different sections that uh, Pavement has.
are various scenes where Abraham and various others, they, they come and just lay down, or another person will grab them and lay them down, and they'll be, that, they'll be laying down their face down for, for a long time while others are dancing. And some will get up, and others actually, once um, Abraham himself lays down, he never gets up again, and that's sort of like right after they have uh, have time of the peace. So he's there for a very long time. Near the end, as this builds again into a, a, a more tense situation, a, the piece ends with the guy coming in. He sits down in front of somebody who's laying down, and he eats Cheetos, sort of like indifferent to, to what's going on. And I think that's, that too is also a very um, powerful image. Uh, image. It really reflects Abraham's concern about what he, the, the type of black male relationships and negotiation that he grew up with and kind of always asking, according to him, always asking questions about it. So I'll close my remarks by saying, by first saying that clearly there remains uh, uh, much to do, yeah, about this topic and, and, and related topics. Um, by using uh, the notion of negotiation, I hope that I've shown that contemporary black scholars like Abraham uh, demonstrate a continued need to explore critical issues around black male identity and masculinity. Um, and that this reflects a broader need for understanding how we imagine and define ourselves and negotiate life in general. Thank you. Oh, I'm, I, maybe I didn't say it clearly enough. That was one of the, it was Boys in the Hood and Du Bois, that passage that I read uh -huh. of Du Bois that inspired the work. Oh, okay. Right. I, I may not have, I might have, might have barbed through that. Uh, but he was, uh, a lot of what he's doing is kind of abstracting a lot of the things that Du Bois says in there, the, the, the yeah, warring between the, yeah. you know, We'll continue conversation with both panelists and papers uh, in just a moment. Thank you again, Carl Paris. Mm -hmm. Go on, get it. 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 Go on, Can I queer this black dance? Can, can I queer this black dance? This dance with its Africanist aesthetics, its, its coolness, what we now call swag, its syncopation and polyrhythms, not, this, not to mention the spaces in which it takes place, the lounges and clubs on the quote unquote bad side of town, the hot summer cookouts and family reunions in the park, the senior citizens exercise class in the church hall on Wednesday afternoons, <laughs> the Duke dancing the African diaspora conference, or what about the music? Even though white artists are winning all the awards, the baseline, the call and response are decidedly black. Again, I ask, can I queer this black dance? Can I move from behind the podium? 
My question, can you hear me if I yell? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> My question riffs off of Thomas DeFrance's inquiry of Ulysses, Ulysses Dove's Bad Blood, where he asked, can this queer dance be black? With surgical precision, DeFrance delineates clear markers of queerness in Dove's work. From his choreography of corporal excess to his disidentificatory practices, bad blood is obviously queer. DeFrance challenges the a priori of analytical devices to analyze dances, as he also notes that its, quote, percussive accents, its sharp edge precision, its presumption of coolness within an overall narrative of abrupt bursts of emotional turmoil make it incontrivably black. Thus, he asks, can this queer dance be black? While de France looks to concert dances for his analysis, I turn to black vernacular dances, where black bodies make meaning out of their quoting experiences, where black people gather amongst each other to discard the masks that grin and lie, that hides our cheeks and shades our eyes. And the polyrhythms call forth our social identities, desires, and frustrations. Now, I've been dancing line dances like all of you, apparently, <laughs> without thinking about it at clubs, with cookouts, amongst family members. But I literally stumbled upon line dance as an object of study by accident. Initially, I went to, I went to look at Chicago step. And I live in Chicago. I don't know how to step. It has this great, rich history. It's, here, it's referred to as an African-American ballroom form. So I was like, ready. I wanted to learn about Chicago step, and I wanted to write about it. I was going to do an ethnography. Geared up and ready to dive into my ethnographic research, I called a male stepping expert, someone that a colleague and friend suggests she ran to him at a conference. He's writing a book about stepping. Um, he, you know, he's open to me talking to him, so give him a call. So we we'll finally have childcare. We're gonna go out and we're gonna launch into stepping, right? So I called the brother up, at which, and he lives in DC, he doesn't live in Chicago. At which time he, and so I said, hey, you know, on a Friday night, what's a good place for a novice to go to in Chicago to go step? And the very first thing he said to me, the first time he informed me that it was dangerous out there and to be careful. In my head, I thought, I ain't no Mark, I got this, I'm good, you know? But thanks for the advice, buddy. He also told me I wasn't going to understand it. No one would ask me to dance. And when I told my girlfriend who I was dragging along with me, Offended, she asked, does he know I'm going? <laughs> Has he seen us? <laughs> does he know who we are? <laughs> and I was like, right? I said, oh, we're dancers. No one's going to ask me to dance, please. Anyway, <laughs> he was right. <laughs> <laughs> they asked, someone asked her to dance, but no one asked me to dance or the tables of other women sitting together. The tiny dance floor was full of heterosexual dyads performing the appropriate steps to the appropriate songs until this startling moment. What? And I was like, DJ Quick is in the house. And in this moment, all the women piled, piled off, emptied off the, their tables and piled onto the dance floor and started doing a step. And in my head, I'm just thinking, I didn't know DJ Quick had a new song, let alone that people could do line dances to it. Come to find out, my, I told my sister that she said the song's probably not new, you probably just don't know it. The song came out in 2006. But anyways, at this moment, where I'm sitting on the sidelines watching, we now had this opportunity, I had this opportunity, to rush out to the dance floor to dance. And I took full advantage of it. And being able to pick up the choreography quickly, it was a relief to be able to dance in line with the other women before the music ended and I had to be relegated back to the sidelines. <laughs> Reflecting upon this moment of dancing, hold on a second. Reflecting upon this moment, this sense of relief that I felt triggered memories of line dances at weddings, family gatherings, heterosexual clubs, and heterosexual black clubs in particular, where some black women described dancing with other women as, quote, gay, and therefore refused to dance unless a man asked them to dance. The line dance moment offers them opportunities to dance and keep their heterosexuality intact. 
Line dancing also gives the reticent to dance because of their presumed lack of skill or shyness orderly steps to follow and execute. Upon first glance, then, the line dance space appears as a generous liberatory space for all who know the steps or can learn them quickly. It gives them opportunity, chances to dance throughout the day or night when otherwise they would be forced to bounce and nod their heads and their seats are next to the chairs. You know what I'm talking about, like when you're at the club and you're just standing behind your chair like, I don't care, I'm good dancing right here, it doesn't matter, I don't need to go to the dance floor. <laughs> that moment. So based on interviews with other women and my own experience in line dance, I contend, however, that queer and politics of respectability bump up and against one another in the African-American line dance space, therefore evoking both melancholy and pleasure. To understand the draw to line dances beyond my own experience, I went to this place in Phoenix, Arizona I'm, uh, called The Battery. It's not the real name, but it's the name for protection. For, the line, for their line dance class night. The bar lounge re resembled others like it found across the country. It resembled the same place I went to in Chicago. You all can picture it very clearly. Dark, a large bar divides the dance floor from the pool tables. Um, you can buy catfish dinners and chicken dinners in the back. The bartender's arm is heavy, and the, uh, the cost for drinks comparatively light. There's like those velvet pictures or like glass pictures of Jordan or like Martin Luther King laced around the, the space. I'm seeing some nods. We've all been to these places, right? So it's a very familiar place, and it's in Arizona. Some of you are probably going, I didn't even know black people were there. They are. <laughs> I'm from there. The male DJ seated comfortably in his booth shouts out, y'all ready? The floor is full of women, all black save one white woman. They all appear to be over 30. I'm here with my, I came with my 63 year old aunt, so I'm guessing the age hovers around 50s, around the 50s. And then I notice some women who dancers with expertise and at times tends to lead, lead the other dancers. Flo proudly informs me that she's 73 years old. And when I asked about her attraction to line dances, she said she evokes respectability politics and heteronormative rules for making it onto the dance floor. She explains that since these days men don't dance, it gives you the opportunity to still dance with quote, style and grace. She also then tells me, as she's walking away, she taps my shoulder to tell me, she also teaches to senior citizens at the local mega church in Arizona, mega Baptist church in Arizona. And she says it's good for their cardiovascular. And then she laughs and says, I have a 90 year old woman doing the Cleveland slide. My aunt echoed her sentiments about the notion of back in the day and the health benefits of line dancing. And this is a lengthy quote from her. So men don't dance today like they did in my day. They called it the swing, but we called it the fast dance and cha-cha and slow dance. We held hands to dance and fans, fast dance. And talking about line dances, I like the way it looks. Everybody in unison. I call them every Wednesday because it's my form of exercise. I end up spending too much money though. I buy a catfish dinner and have three wines. <laughs> My own sentiments apart support Flo's nostalgic reflections of on back in her day, right? I, I include the catfish line to illustrate the multiple functions of this space of where line dances take place. And as you can see, catfish fried or grilled always seems to be present. For women growing up dancing prior to the onslaught of disco and thus the dissolution of couple dances, they recover their dancing bodies through line dances. And as noted, it serves as a form of exercise and socialization. The younger crowd, however, makes a concerted effort to seek safe spaces to dance and identify line dance as a space and place. Tiffany, a 25-year-old recent graduate explains, college grad explains, in my generation, men don't ask you to dance, they just come up to you and grind. So if you don't like clubbing and want to hear soul music, without the degrading, sexually explicit lyrics glorifying violence and sex, just getting down to our old school roots, you can still enjoy line dancing. And then she added, and it's generally older, more, uh, more, older, more affluent crowd. I mean middle class. It's sisterly and no pressure. If you don't know it, you can sit down or stay up there and someone will come help you. I have to note that Tiffany added the middle class line because when a friend first approached her about coming to the battery, her initial response was, I don't want to go to that ghetto ass battery. Too many people get shot up there. I'm from the South Side, I know what's up. Tiffany's comments and those of the other women I interviewed formally and informally suggest that line dance is a fun, free space for women to dance without men and offensive lyrics. 
In the longer version of this paper, I would talk about the DJ Quick song, the Wobble Wobble, all of them, and how it's male men instructing women to back, to back their things up and all kinds of things. I think that to some extent, the extent to which those words are blocked out and it becomes a space for style and grace and it's a disidentificatory practice as well. Their description of unified style and grace and middle class dancing body is in a presumed ghetto space exemplify respectability politics that govern the appropriateness of black bodies dancing through space. The line dance space is the sanctioned space for black women to dance with other women without appearing queer and without male partners. But can I queer this black dance? The line dance space is a queer space that momentarily masks sexual difference, age, and class amongst black women, amongst other identities. Although many women express a desire for a male partner with whom to dance, ultimately, the female bodies in the space choreograph heterogeneous constructions of black female corporeality unavailable through the controlling images of African American women circulating in the media. The corporealities of the tables of women who pour onto the floor or the woman who jumps up to leave her male counterpart are unknown to us. The assumption of heterosexuality is naive and heterosexist at best. Line dance is a heterogeneous space, as a heterogeneous space allows women to safely dance alongside their female partners without the threat of violence or looks of disapproval from strangers at the club or loved ones at the family reunion. Line dances put working class and upwardly mobile black dancing bodies side by side because you can rest assured that although the parking lot is laced with Volvos and Benzes, some got it honest and others just got it like that. <laughs> Grandmas and granddaughters, aunts and nieces dance side by side instructing one another. But I will not identify the line dance space as a utopia, for within this space, melancholy lurks. The line dance space assuages the anxiety of not being asked to dance, and the real mourning for someone to dance with, or the time when your partner was there and you could dance with him or her. At the same, it simultaneously relieves and highlights the feelings of self-doubt and insecurity many women experience at not being asked to dance. And that it is unsafe to be out with the same-sex partner amongst beloved family and friends illuminates the homophobia and factions of black communities. The surprise expressed when we can dance in the hood unscathed highlights the post-traumatic post stress experienced from violence in black spaces. Yes, I queer this space and note its melancholy, but as a space for black women, line dancing is also a pleasurable space, thus employing the both and. Black feminist scholar Patricia Hill Collins reminds us that black women do not have the luxury of choosing the either or with which to identify our, our oppression. Instead, as both race and gender, Oppression intersects black female corporeality on multiple levels at once. As Evelyn Hammond summons us to do, however, I want to move away from articulating oppression to theorizing pleasure. So I cannot leave the line dance space in its melancholic state without acknowledging the pleasure it generates in dancing bodies and noting how black women dance through melancholy to experience pleasure. Sadia Hartman offers a useful paradigm by which to understand how black bodies materialize the both and through our performance practices. Hartman contend the, that black identity constructed under the reins of slavery terror, slavery's terror ensured that black people in the United States corporately understand how to negotiate joy and pain, violence and terror simultaneously. The women on the floor dancing to DJ Quick or Robin Thicke, did you know there was, there was a line dance of blurred lines, and, yeah. Robin Thicke doing the Cupid shuffle, the wobble, or the good old electric slide, find pleasure in dancing in time with other women, in spite of the desire to dance with a partner, female or male, in spite of sexually explicit lyrics that work against the grace and elegance they feel, and in spite of class differences that separate and segregate. The line dance space is a liminal space 
where heteronormative codes of appropriateness are simultaneously suspended and enacted. It is a homosocial homo space for women, mostly black, to embody, explore, express, and express their physicality and sensual selves. Assuredly, line dances are black. And although the women at First Institutional Baptist Church or the women at the battle, or some of them might resent and wouldn't talk to me if they knew that I was going to attach queer to their dancing bodies and their chosen aesthetic. I'm going to go ahead and queer this black dance. Thank you. Go ahead. Enjoy yourself. Thank you. majority female space, but that there are, there are men in that space as well. And there are men that don't adhere to heteronormative ideals. So it was just an uh, oversight in this moment, but not an oversight in the work. Thanks, though. I'd like to invite Carl back up, and maybe we could have some cross-conversation about the two presentations. Uh, I find that there is often an American fetishism with the uh, status, if you will, of kind of generalizing that, oh, you're a black male, you must have worked so hard to not become a drug dealer. And this is like, that's actually not true, you know, I, no. You know, and so my question is, beyond that, um, one of the things I often find is, though we look at black males from this outside eye, you know, are you actually talking with black males in the situations as gangbangers, as drug dealers, um, from, are you actually engaging them? I think one of the things that frustrated me so much throughout the George Zimmerman trial for him killing Trayvon Martin was the fact that no one actually put the, the microphone in front of black males. And no one allowed us to speak for ourselves. And that's something that very, very much frustrates me in a situation because there's always, oh, they're in danger and they're always gonna just, they're just these you know, beings that will kill themselves. And this is like, well, no. I have friends who were drug dealers and gang burglars as well, and I have friends who are now aeronautical engineers, and we all went to high school together, and we all still are friends to this day. That does not make them any less intelligent or any less you know, meaningful, but in the, in the sense that we're pluralistic, and I find that that's something that is frustratingly left out of the conversation about our existence. I am looking for what it, I think you're kind of getting at, it, it, it shouldn't be a one-way street. No, it has to somehow get back, no? So that, I, I don't know, it's hard, I find it hard to find dancers who do that, you know, who, who, who do strike up that conversation. Uh, Kyle Abraham would be a great person to do that because he, he grew up through that. He embodies it, but does he, does it just stay in the theater? I think, I think you're getting a little bit at that, you know? Uh, is it our place, is it our place as dancers to, to, to strike up that conversation? Um, is there a, a, a give and take? I don't, I don't know if I'm reacting to your statement, but that's what I got out of it. Could I ask you to each, since you were so focused on um, women's space and not a feminine, but women's spaces, and so focused on masculinity, could you talk across, so could you talk about feminine in the work that you're looking at or women's presence? And could you talk about masculinity, you know, not just like queer people who are there, but masculinity as a concept in the spaces that you're looking at? Yes. Yeah. 
I think that um, for me in the spaces that, that I've looked at here, that the masculinity, the a, a presence of masculinity is largely what makes the line dance space for women this sort of liberatory, queer, pleasurable space because it is exactly sort of a, an escape of or a desire for that masculine presence that makes, that creates sort of the melancholy is what I think. I think that it is exactly this waiting to be asked to dance or this fear of dancing or being left on the sidelines that, um, and it's a, a desire for, in this particular case, there's a large love and the, the way the women talk about it, that this missing male partner, this missing, that, that creates that space is why there's so many, majority of that space largely are women piling onto that floor because in that moment, they don't need that thing that they appear to be sort of mourning. For me, yeah, um, I was talking to my friend Donna this afternoon about this very same subject, that the next step, really, and it's, I find it very difficult, and I've been grappling with it for a long time, uh, the next step is to look at the female in, in, in that space, you know? The interaction, uh, whatever comes up, uh, I was saying to her, one of the people who uh, Jawale's work for me, even if by the fact that it's, it's all women, there's something about Jawale's work that the absence of the male is still present for me. Uh, with her, like hair stories, with the James Brown, the music that the fact she uses James Brown, I think there's something to investigate there. And in this work, I'm looking for it, but I haven't quite put my finger on it yet, but I'm really, really uh, uh, interested in that, in that question. Can I answer it again? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I want to add to that, too, that, in, in this, that it is still within a masculine sphere. Like, there's no escaping it, because the music, it's all men. It's a very it's a hyper-masculine sphere at that moment, in that the, the lyrics, the voices, it's a style that we're accustomed to within hip hop or go go, or, but it's a hyper masculine sphere in which this is taking place, I would say. It's ironic that the way you were speaking for women, that that space exists. Um, a couple of clubs that I have been to, I have heard the same statement made from men that they are now are rushing to the floor to dance mm -hmm. because they say women don't want to dance. And so I, and that's, that was ironic that you said that, and they could not get a dance partner, and so it's like it's crowding the floor, and they're enjoying it just as much as the women. I'm, I'm wondering about like queerness and gender performativity that you all are talking about in your um, presentations, and I'm wondering, have you all thought about how things might look different from community to community as far as queerness goes and as far as gender goes within the African American context? You know, I, I'm being real, for me, being really specific about looking at, in this, for this work, looking at black spaces. I think that when, because I think a lot of, some, because when I was talking to this about, with a friend, they mentioned Zumba, you know, that Zumba kind of does the same thing. And um, I, it does to some extent, but it does not at the same time. Because when people are coming to, for something like Zumba, where it is, largely women in the space, but a lot of men as well, right? But it's still largely a female space. Um, that, and it is a safe space sort of to like, in Zumba in particular, there's an expression of, of sexuality that I don't necessarily see present in, um, in line dances in the same way, right? Like people go to Zumba because it gives them opportunity to move their hips and get down, right? It, it, puts, it takes a, a notion of a, sexy lat Latina and put, get, you get to try that on. And then when you leave there, you don't have to participate in that anymore, but it was safe because it was in that space. I don't necessarily see the same thing happening in line dance spaces. And related to what you're saying, probably not the same thing, but I'm also very curious about a, a company like uh, Kyle Abrahams, how, what the audience performer relationship is in different venues. Yeah, it's also another big thing. 
because that too is about who's who's seeing and, and you know what is being seen and what is being what meanings one are, are, are getting from what they're seeing and that sort of thing too. Uh, it's, it's one of those difficult uh, themes but I, I think it's also. And lawyers and judges and things and they're doing line dance and it's totally opposite of what you may find in or what you may perceive in a club. They have a whole nother perspective of the reason they're doing it. So I kind of agree with that. Even if it's not, even if it's still in a black neighborhood or something, but just a different type atmosphere, a different event. Right. And I think that, that it is that moment, because I think it, it, if the song comes on and there are black people around, regardless of where they are, like I knew what would happen here, if I put it on, if people knew it, they would get up and dance, right? And I think that that, that it happens where, I say where two or more are gathered. <laughs> <laughs> where two or more are gathered. Now the performance of it, you know, with if, depending on how it's constructed, they're at work, it's a thing, might be different, right? It may be toned down. Um, but I do think it is that, that moment of like, we know this, we're, in, we're, perform we're doing this together. It's like this performance of a black identity in, a, in that moment. And I think that it might be, you might not back it up as low or drop it as low when you're in your suit. <laughs> Right, but I think that it is this moment of co cohesion, regardless of where it's taking place. Mm -hmm. If the song comes on and you know it, if people do it. Conversation to be continued. Let's thank Raquel.